our next concept is vectors in three dimensions or even beyond. So we're going to start with three dimensions and talk about vectors in what we're going to call space. So yeah, whenever I say the plane, I mean two dimensions. And whenever I'm referring to space, I mean three dimensions, x, y, z, as we'll see. So first things first, um, if we're going to talk about, well, we're, we're very used to how to get around in the plane, right? We, we all agree that this is the positive x direction and this is the positive y direction and negative x, negative y, et cetera. We all understand that. Um, but if we hadn't established those uh, rules at the beginning, it would be hard to, to establish a collective language and understand how to move around and, and what we were talking about. So to orient ourselves in three dimensions, we use something called the right-hand rule. And uh, for those of you who are left-handed like me, uh, apologies, the left-hand rule while a thing, uh, the right-handers won out, and this is the generally accepted convention. So the right-hand rule, and I encourage you to do this with me. Hold your right hand up uh, in front of you, and then this is part that's left out of the instructions most of the time when it's taught. And I encourage you to turn it to a 90-degree angle so, so that it's pointing to the right of you. Um, and then take your thumb, make sure it's extended upwards, and then take the fingers of your other four hands and sweep them closed into a fist. And as you sweep your fingers closed, they'll first pass over the positive x-axis and then the positive y-axis, which gives us the usual anti-clockwise orientation in the x-y plane that we're used to with the addition of the positive z direction being the direction of our thumb placing up. If you think about it, it's kind of like imagining you're standing on the ground in the, in the direction of the ground, the plane you're standing on is the xy plane, and to your right is the positive x-axis, and straight ahead is the positive y direction, y-axis, and then your vertical positive direction, the direction of you standing upward, is the positive z direction. And by holding your hand out to the right, your hand should be pointing in the positive x direction, and as you sweep it through, it will extend that way. Now you're allowed to rotate this plane underneath you in three space, which is what makes it a little tricky. And, and uh, sometimes as, a, as we draw things, it's very, very common to sketch things in three dimensions like this, where we put the X kind of extending towards us and the Y off to the right and then Z like that. Um, but if you imagine taking the picture I just drew and sort of rotating it along the, the, the positive Z axis, you would see that this x-axis would kind of rotate over there and you could end up with the sort of standard orientation that we're kind of used to with uh, in the plane. So yeah, take a moment and think about that. Uh, it's gonna be important because we're gonna use this from here on out. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, where do we start in two space? We started with points and we gave points, the, they had two coordinates, we call them X and Y. And so in space, in three dimensions, those coordinates are going to be X, Y, and Z. And you can see that the point two, three, four in the X direction here has, we travel two in the X direction, and then we travel from there, we travel then three in the Y direction. Oh, I should, you know what? Sorry about that, out of focus there. Let's use some colors to match these axes here. So sure enough, we travel two along the X direction axis. And then once you're there, just like, um, just like in the XY plane, you can go X or Y first, but you start and you go one direction and then travel from that new point in the next direction. So now from that location, we're gonna travel three in the Y direction since the Y axis is green there and kind of emphasizing that we're traveling parallel to the y-axis and parallel to the x-axis direction. And then last but not least, uh, the z-axis is notated in blue here, and we're gonna travel up four in the direction of z. All right, we've got a lot going on here, and sometimes it can be helpful to sort of draw a three-dimensional box that represents this. So let me try and do that. Um, let's see here. Okay. Well, we've gone three in the y direction. So, you know, we would have a line that extends here to three in that direction. And then we could take this parallel and emphasize that sure enough, that's traveled in the y direction. There we go, we've got the base of our box. Now to get up to that z point, we're gonna travel four vertical. So we'll make this on the z axis. We'll go four vertical here. Um, and I don't know, we'll go about four vertical here, about four vertical here and uh, and then we'll see that, okay, now taking these and going parallel in all the directions, you sure enough, you get yourself a nice little three-dimensional box. 
And we can see that the point is you could choose to first travel four in the z direction, and then you could travel um, three in the y direction, and then you could travel two in the x direction. And just like in the coordinate plane, x, y plane, you can go x first and then y, or y first and then x. In the uh, space, you can, with uh, since we've agreed on the orientation here, you can travel in whichever coordinate direction you want first, and you'll always end up at that same point. All right, so it, sometimes it can be a little hard to visualize things in three space. And so there's a, a great uh, calculator. Um, and it's, I've got also some nice calculators posted on the course site, but GeoGebra is gonna be useful, I think, cause it's probably the, well, it's, well, it's a little, uh, yeah, as with anything, learning a new skill can take a little bit of time and effort, but let me just quickly show you how to plot something in GeoGebra here. But before we do that, let's read the rest of this slide. Um, GeoGebra is a great resource for three space. When you do go there, you have to collect the 3D calculator and I'll show you that. So in two dimensions, kind of informally, apart from points, the simplest concept were lines. And here I've plotted the Y equals X line. Um, now in three dimensions, informally, kind of our simplest concept, again, apart from points are gonna be not lines, but sort of the natural extension of a line into three directions, but a plane. So let's try and plot a plane in GeoGebra real quick as an example here. Let's get out of here, click this rig. Ah, oh, there we go, it worked. All right, so GeoGebra, if you search to it, it'll get you there. And uh, if you launch the calculator from the, their front page, you'll have to, it goes into two dimensions first, and so you click this and select their 3D calculator. Get that out of there. Um, sorry, on the tablet, the uh, keyboard can be a little obnoxious here. Well, let's try and plot that y equals x, uh, the, the line y equals x, and see what happens. Y, oh, got to get capital off here. Y is equal to x. Hey, check that out. All right, I will quickly turn off that gray plane. That gray plane emphasizes the xy plane there. I want everything else to stay on. And, uh, oh, I don't know, we could adjust this maybe. Maybe we can, maybe we can't. Nope, all right. So the nice thing about GeoGebra here is that x-axis, if you, again, here's an opportunity to practice the right-hand rule. Hold out your hand, vertical thumb for x-axis, point your hand to the right, swing your forefingers, index fingers closed, and you'll first swing through that positive red axis, which is the y-axis, and then the positive green axis, which is the, the uh, Y axis. If you want to turn that on this little settings wheel and this settings allows you to do that. But uh, so how is this, why is this nice? Right now it looks like kind of this big thing. Well, it's nice because I can just touch the screen or use the mouse as you are and drag things around and sort of change the orientation of this. Uh, let's see, well, X and Y, there we go. X and Y and sort of the usual orientation. And then I'll drag this back like that. And yeah, Z being straight up out of the computer, if you will now, and X and Y being what we are, you can kind of see there's that diagonal Y equals X line. But then since we haven't told, uh, given Z a restriction, just like horizontal and vertical lines in the two plane, you just say X equals one, and then the Y can run wild and you get a horizontal line. Since we've only specified Y must be equal to X, there's no requirement on the Z, which means Z can run wild above or below this line and we generate a plane in three space. Anyway, GeoGebra is exceptionally helpful thing to help kind of visualize some of the things we'll be working with. Uh, so uh, I don't know, we just, we're talking about 3D vectors here. So let's just show you how to input a vector real quick. All right. Um, so if you type in vector, notice that it prompts you with all kinds of options. And then if you explore those options, it says point. Oh, you can give it a point or you can give it a start point and an end point. If you just put in a point, it'll give you the position vector. And if you give it a start point and an end point, it'll give you the vector in space going from the start point to the end point. So let's just get a position vector and we'll use the point one, two, three. Now here GeoGebra requires you to put a point uh, in parentheses. If I left these inner parentheses off, um, oh, this is gonna be annoying. One comma two comma three. All right, get out of there. 
now you can see that we've got ourselves a vector that goes to the point one, two, three, the position vector in three space for this. And we'll cover this eventually, but hopefully this helps a little bit. And just for fun, let's pull out one that doesn't start at the origin. So vector um, parentheses. Now here, the syntax, you can kind of see it'll pop up with little cues here. Um, that won't accept it until I've corrected that. We'll have parentheses, I don't know. Let's go from one, we'll start at the point we just did. I'll stack up some vectors here. And then we close our parentheses. And then the syntax here is uh, point comma second point. So initial point, terminal point. So it gives me a set of parentheses. I don't know, let's go, let's go two um, comma negative four. I don't know, comma, let's not get crazy here. Let's go back to, a, a, I don't know, one. 1.5, there we go, we'll use a decimal. And there we are. Notice that the second vector I put there started at the end or the terminal point of the first vector and goes between the two points in space that I specified. Anyway, I encourage you to explore GeoGebra. If you ever have any questions how to do anything, please don't hesitate to ask. There's also lots of great uh, YouTubes or just quick Google searches that can help you if you're looking to do something in GeoGebra because that's how I learned it all. All right, so now back to the task at hand. And let's get after it. So um, we in two space, oh yeah, well, I've got that on the side. So just as we define horizontal lines as y is equal to, or vertical lines as x is equal to. Uh, so horizontal line is y is equal to a number and letting x vary. When we wish to fix a plane in the direction of a single coordinate, we call it a coordinate plane. Um, and we define it as z is equal to number, whatever coordinate we're interested in. So here, as an example, I've plotted a vertical line, x is equal to three. And since we've given no restriction on y, the y coordinate can just run wild. So, you know, you get points like three comma three, x is definitely three. Then down here, one comma three, x is still three, zero comma three, y can do whatever it wants to, as long as that, oh, do you guys see what I've done here? Um, three comma one three comma zero, three comma negative, that's right. So X stays fixed and Y can be whatever it wants to. Similarly over here, I don't know, we could sort of consider the point two, two in the X, Y plane. Now we kind of extend that up onto our Z plane. There we go. And sure enough, that point right there is gonna be two comma two, but the Z value is always gonna be fixed at three. So every point on this plane, X and Y can be whatever it wants. So it's basically a copy of the X, Y plane, just fixed at the height Z equals three in space. So let me make a correction here. I called this coordinate planes. Um, and this isn't totally correct here because coordinate planes are generally accepted to be just like this is the Y axis and this is the X axis. Those are our axes. Um, coordinate planes are the planes that follow the path of the axes here. This is just kind of a um, simple plane. Let's just leave that be. All right, coordinate planes. Uh, well, the X, Y plane, well, we can let X and Y be anything we want to, but how does that work in three space? Well, we would have to fix Z is equal to zero. That's gonna give us just the, just the kind of flat X, Y plane that we're used to. What if we were interested in the YZ plane? Well, let's draw a quick sketch here. So we got the usual way to draw things. Z is vertical, X, Y, that gives us the right-hand rule orientation. Okay, we want the YZ plane. Well, we want any point that's on the YZ plane. What does that mean? That means we're, we don't want any of these X values. We wanna, we wanna fix X to be zero. And so the plane we get is kind of gonna be this plane. How do we extend that? We kind of extend it like this in three space. And you would get all of the points on this plane are going to have the x coordinate equal to zero. And similarly for the x z plane, you want x and z to vary freely. And so you fix y is equal to zero and you will get the x z plane. And I don't know, let's see if we can draw that. Well, the x z plane would kind of be like this, it would extend in that direction. And so you would get a plane like this. And drawing these things kind of parallel to the axes can help. And I encourage you to take a moment 
pause this, fire up GeoGebra, and plot those and sort of look at them and think about them. Uh, technically, we can define octants, uh, similar to the way we define quadrants in the uh, X, Y plane. Um, however, we almost never reference these. And so I'll let you read about them slash explore the uh, graph I put on the site. All right, so now for lines in three space. Uh, lines and curves in space are best thought of as the intersection of two planes or other surfaces. So for an example here, a line that's parallel to the y-axis with points of the form two comma y comma five. So if it's parallel to the y-axis, um, we want y to vary, but everything else has to be fixed. So we've fixed x is equal to two and z is equal to five. And x is equal to two is given by this. I don't have a blue highlighter. Do I? I can change this green one to blue, blue real quick. There we go. So x is equal to two is given by that blue plane. I don't have a purple highlighter, but we can just get one quick. And z is equal to five is given by the purple plane shown below. And you can see that green intersection there. The green intersection, well, I should stop messing around with highlighters. So that gr the intersection of these two planes is that green line uh, right there. So lines are a little bit harder to express in space than they are in, in uh, two dimensions. And as we'll see later uh, in this course, uh, in the coming section, uh, the best way to do them is to, to express a line is to use vectors, but we'll get there. Right, so just for fun, we're still kind of introducing the concept of space here and kind of getting used to working in three space. And so here's a couple cylinders, uh, x squared plus y squared in the plane, the x plane, y plane, you can see I kind of tried to emphasize it with this version of, the, there's the unit circle right there. But since z, we haven't restricted the z coordinate to anything, the z coordinate can just run wide. And so you have that, a unit circle in the xy plane extending vertically in the z direction. Well, if we wanted to do a cylinder in another direction, we could just say leave the x coordinate out and z squared plus y squared would give us this in the, the z y plane at one, one, we'll get a unit circle kind of right on this in the y z plane here. It's not half bad. And then since X hasn't been restricted, it'll allow that cylinder to extend in the X direction. So GeoGebra is great, uh, but it fails for some regions. So being able to sketch these and describe these regions is a helpful and important skill. So let's take a look at this, this list and see if we can describe this. So Z is greater than or equal to zero. I can think about that. I'm going to run out of room to sketch on this thing, but I, I really say pause the video here and try and draw what you think it is. Well, if z is greater than zero, then it's kind of going to be all of these points here that are kind of above the xy plane. And sure enough, z is greater than or equal to zero represents kind of the quote half space, half of the available space on or above the xy plane on or above, it's on because it's equal to zero. If it was strictly greater than zero, it would just be the space up strictly above the xy plane. So what about x is equal to negative three? Well, this is going to be the plane that is perpendicular to the x axis because it's a plane in the x direction. So it's gonna be parallel to the x axis at x is equal to negative three. So it's also going to be parallel uh, since it's perpendicular. Wait, I have things written wrong on my paper, for which I apologize. It's not going to be perpendicular to the x-axis. It's going to be parallel to the x-axis. Nope, I was right the first time. Apologies here. Let's, let's take a moment and let's actually try and draw this. All right, so. X is here, Y is here, and Z is here. Now, if we want to fix X is equal to negative three, we're gonna to have to let that X axis extend in the negative direction. And I'll give it one, two, three tick marks. And so a plane in this direction is gonna be the plane that kind of extends this way. And it goes both up and down. All right, so that's kind of our plane. It's gonna extend in all directions in this way. And it's, and it's at that point, negative 
x is equal to negative 3 there. And so from here, you can definitely see that, yes, in fact, this thing is perpendicular to the x-axis, and it's parallel to the y-z plane. All right, so let's, let's get a little more complicated here. Um, let's say that z has to be 0. x has to be less than or equal to 0, which is a fancy way of saying it has to be negative. And y has to be greater than or equal to 0, which is a fancy way of saying it has to be positive. So what do we have here? Well, the z equals 0 part over here, we'll kind of sketch it. Uh, well, let's just sketch this one here. There we go. x, y, z in the positive directions all. So if z is equal to 0, well, that's the x, y plane. All right, so I know I'm restricted to the x, y plane. I don't need any of this vertical axis or negative vertical axis stuff. OK, so now x is less than 0. Well, we know this direction is the positive x direction. And so I want things back here in the negative x direction. But y being positive means we only want this direction. And so what we want here is this is a fancy way of saying just this portion of space since z is equal to 0. And what we have is we have this is quadrant 1 because it's both positives. And then as you continue anti-clockwise, we have quadrant two in the x, y plane can be given by these three restrictions. All right, our fourth example here, x is greater than or equal to zero. Again, it's positive. y is greater than or equal to zero, it's positive. And z is greater than or equal to zero, it's positive. What does that give us? Well, let's draw this picture kind of over here. Beginning to think I should have put this on more than one slide but what's done is done. All right, so if we want the positive extraction, let's get ourselves a, blue, a green highlighter because I want the green things here. What do we, give me a green, I don't know, green? Is that a nice green? That looks like a nice green. Okay, so in the positive x direction, I want this general area so I can extend things here. In the positive y direction, I want that general area. In the positive z direction, I want that general area. But I don't want anything behind it. I don't want any of the negative x direction or negative y or negative z. And so if I were to imagine extending this, what would I get? I would get kind of this little three-dimensional box. And sure enough, let me draw a couple of lines in here to sort of emphasize what we've got. Now, those are not finite. Those would keep extending in these directions. And we have what we would call the first octant, the portion of space where all of our coordinates are positive, x, y, and z. All right, now down to our next one. Negative 1 less than or equal to y is less than or equal to negative 1. OK, so again, we'll try and sketch this little guy. And I fear I'm going to run out of room, but that's OK. We can always grab another sheet of paper here, x, y, z. Well, so we want to let y extend in the negative direction. And if you haven't noticed by now, I kind of like to let the negative direction be kind of a dotted line. And so y can go between positive 1 and negative 1 here. And if we're allowing that, well, then what we're going to get is we're kind of going to get these, this sort of, I'm going to allow y to extend this direction. I'm, I'm going to get a plane here that's going to be y is equal to 1. And then similarly, I'm going to get a, plot, a plane over here y is equal to negative 1. It's going to kind of be parallel there. And what we're going to get is we're going to get all of this region that's kind of trapped between these two planes. We're going to end up with sort of a, an infinite rectangular box here that's trapped between the planes y equals 1 and y is equal to negative 1. All right, so let's see now for our next one, y is equal to negative 2. Uh, let's go ahead and draw an arrow here. This goes to here. y is equal to negative 2, and z is equal to 2. Well, this is going to give us a line. We saw an example of this before, but let's just go ahead and do this. We'll put this one right over here. x, y, z. And so when y is equal to negative 2, we're going to have do, do, do. We're going to have negative 2 here. So we're going to get a plane in this direction. And then when z is equal to positive 2, 
Well, now we're going to get a plane in kind of this direction. Um, and if I were to extend that over, I would have it like that. And what you're going to get when these two things meet, well, let's give ourselves, whoops, get out of there. Let's make these planes a little bit better. Give them three sides, kind of extend these planes out. All right, so where are these planes going to intersect? Well, these planes are gonna intersect along this blue line here. Where the two planes are gonna intersect are gonna be this line right here. And it's gonna be the line that's got, that is on the plane z is equal to two. You can see it at that height, but it's also in the plane of y is equal to negative two. So you're gonna have the intersection of line. And this, would, this is a good one to check on GeoGebra too. All right, so now, Let's get fancy. Y is equal to X squared. Okay, let's see about that. Well, I've got enough room to do this one. Let's, let's get this one right down here. Y is equal to X squared. And then X squared plus Y squared equals one. Just go ahead and pop backwards a few slides because we've seen that one already. That's the cylinder extending. Uh, that's, the, that's defined by the unit circle in the plane extending vertically in the Z direction. So now Y is equal to z squared. Well, just imagine what this would be in the plane. Well, in the plane, in the, in the y is equal to x plane, we would have a negative y direction here. And y is equal to x squared is the parabola that we all know and love from our previous studies in maths. So you got yourself a nice little parabola in the y is equal to z plane. Now, since we haven't, I'm sorry, I said y is equal to z plane and the xy plane. All right, so now we've not got any restriction on the z variable here. So this thing can vary any way we want to, vertically up and down. And so I'm just going to go ahead and draw uh, way up here, kind of over the top of this stuff, because we're done with the uh, actual things on the slide. I'm going to go ahead and, and just anchor this parabola vertically at some arbitrary height here in the z direction. And what we would get is we would extend that down there and then extend this piece down. And I'm gonna, what, I'm gonna shorten up this little guy just for to make this a little more clear. Shorten up the parabola down there in, in the space there. Now that line is the extension of that down, but it's behind this kind of surface in front of us. And what we have here is if I were to shade in this surface, well, let's use a different color here. Let's use blue. If I were to shade in this surface, I would kind of have this part of the kind of curved wall of that parabola represented vertically. And then behind it, I would have the other side of the parabola. And then I should be doing these ones with dashed lines. Oh, and I've gone too far there. Those lines should go. There we go. And again, go ahead and fire up GeoGebra and kind of explore this and you'll be able to see that it's pretty nice and intuitive to be able to maneuver this thing and manipulate it in the computers to sort of see it as we change it around or move it and look at it from different perspectives here. Well, yeah, being able to sketch and describe these things is going to be an important skill in visualizing things. So use technology, but use it well. All right, so the next thing we need to talk about in space is distance. And so the two-dimensional distance formula, the Pythagorean form ex uh, theorem, extends to three space as distance d between two points, p is equal to px, py, pz, and q is equal to qx, qy, and qz. And you just take, and you take the square root of the differences of their coordinates. So qx minus px squared and qy minus py squared and qy minus py. Oh, there's another typo. qz minus pz squared. Apologies for the typo. All right. Um, and just for fun, and we may see it occasionally, to represent a, th a sphere in three space, um, you can have a sphere of radius r centered at the point x0, y0, and z0, given by x minus x0 squared plus the quantity y minus y0 squared plus the quantity z minus z0 squared is equal to r squared. And we'll learn about a nicer way to represent spheres when we get into different coordinate systems. But for now, this is how you represent it in the standard rectangular coordinate system that we're used to. So now that we've kind of introduced how to think about and uh, work with concepts in space, three dimensions, let's talk about vectors in space. And the nice news is 
everything we talked about in the prior section with vectors and vectors in 2D extends naturally into three dimensions. So that's what it says. And in many cases beyond as well, uh, although we can't visualize it as easily or at all. Uh, so really, we've got all the same ideas. We just got an extra coordinate direction now, that vertical Z direction. And vectors will have three components, the X, Y, and Z components. And there's a nice graph showing the vector 2, 5, and 3, where you can see the X, Y, and Z components plotted. And there's a link to that. I'm not going to click it at the moment because it's on the course site too. So finding, finding position vectors, uh, similar to what we did in to space, we just give ourselves that third coordinate where you take the terminal Z co coordinate of the point and subtract the, the initial Z coordinate of the P point, and that gives you your Z component for your vector. So for example, let's find the position vector for with initial point negative three, four, one, and terminal point negative five to two. So the point or the vector from P to Q, PQ, um, if we want to do QP, we would definitely write it like that, but we don't. So initial first, terminal last, subtract the X coordinates, starting with the terminal point, negative five, subtracting the initial X coordinate of negative three. I'm not going to go ahead and read the rest of these uh, because it's a lot uh, and I'm bound to make a mistake. Uh, although, while what it says on the screen is correct, notice that um, that is incorrect. What we have here is you would take the terminal y coordinate of two and subtract the initial y coordinate of four, which will in fact give us our negative two as we see. Now I've plotted in three space here, the point or the actual vector between point P to point Q as well as the equivalent position vector of negative two, negative two, and one. Similar to the way that uh, we saw that the distance formula, uh, the Pythagorean theorem extended uh, from two space into three space, the concept of magnitude or length of a vector in three space can be found very similarly, just under that square root, adding now the Z coordinate being, or I'm sorry, Z component being squared. So the magnitude of the vector we just found, negative two, negative two, one, we just take the square root of the squares of uh, the sum of the squares of the components, negative two squared plus negative two squared plus one squared gives us square root of nine, which gives us a length of three or a magnitude of three. Uh, similar to scalar multiplication in two dimensions, scalar multiplication in three dimensions is sort of just, while distribution is not the correct term here, we're going to use it because I think it gives an intuitive way of thinking about it. You just distribute the number A to each of the components, the X component, Y component, and Z component of your vector. And vector addition, instead of just having to combine the X and Y components, you now have to combine the Z components. And again, there should be a U sub Z here and a V sub Z there. Um, the geometric interpretation of adding vectors tip to tail that we saw in two space extends in three space. It's just a little harder to visualize, um, but if you use GeoGebra and use that initial point, uh, terminal point syntax, you are, will be able to see it if you wish. Uh, again, same idea uh, for unit vectors to scale the length of a vector down to length one, you just sort of multiply that vector by one over the magnitude of the vector. Um, while division of vectors is not a thing, you could think of dividing the components of the vector by the length of the vector will scale the vector down to one, because that is what scalar multiplication by one over the length will give you division by the length of each of the individual components. Um, just like we had i and j in two dimensions, we have to extend that idea for the unit standard vectors into three dimensions, giving us a new vector, which i, j, k would be the logical choice here, and it's what we use. k is the unit standard vector in the z direction. So let's take a moment just to draw these, just to make sure that I don't have anything on that rest of the slide. Here we go, we'll draw these. 
got the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. All right, we will do this in the order of i in the x direction. Well, let's give ourselves some hash marks first. We got one, one, and one tick marks. Okay, so now in the x direction, the unit vector that has one in the x direction and zero in the y and z direction is going to be i, the vector i. And in the y direction, we have zero in the x direction, zero in the z direction, so just one in the y direction. This gives us the vector j. And then last but not least, we'll use orange here for the z direction unit standard vector k. Zero in the x and y directions, just one vertical in the z direction gives you k. And just like in two dimensions, working with unit standard vector notation kind of makes it um, nice because we can treat them like we're used to with respect to variables. So if we let u be, instead of writing u as negative one, three, one, and v as, oh, well, that's interesting. We got four in the x direction and seven in the, the, the y direction. Well, what about the z direction? Well, note that it's not gone, but zero times k would just be zero. And so we have this setting there. You see that v in unit standard notation, when there is no z direction, we don't write plus zero k, we just write it as plus four i and positive seven j and leave the zero k off. Um, but it's important to recognize that. Okay, so having these in unit standard notation, if we wanted to find u minus v, well, u is negative one i plus three j plus k minus, now I'm using a parentheses here because four i plus four j or plus seven j, remember we're gonna treat them like variables. Well, that, that works. If these were x's and y's and things, we could, we could do this. We would just distribute this negative sign to get negative four i minus seven j. And then we would combine like terms. Sure enough, we'd take this negative one i and negative four i to get negative five. And then we would take positive three j and negative seven j to get negative four j. And then last but not least, plus k would give us just plus k. Similarly, for two u plus three v, we would again distribute, multiply u by two by distributing it through its uh, unit standard vector notation pieces uh, to get negative two i plus six j plus two k. And then distributing three times v, we would get positive 12 i plus 21 j. And again, combining like terms, negative two i plus 12 i is 10 i. And I'm even saying combining like terms here, but we're, we're just collecting the scalar multiples in front of the vectors. But it's easier to think of and say is combining like terms. Uh, 21 j and 6 j gives us 27 j. And last but not least, we've just got 2 k that comes along for the ride. All right, uh, so let's go ahead as our next example and find using the same vectors we had before, u and u and let's find the magnitude of one half of u. Well, the first thing we would do is we would have to scale u down by one half. So we'll we'll multiply u by one half, which will give us right here negative one half i plus three halves j plus one half k. And then to find the magnitude of that, we would take the sum of the squares of the components of the vector and whack it underneath the square root. Negative one half squared plus three half squared plus one half squared gives us, as we can see, square root of 11 over four, which if you tidy up since root four becomes two, tidies up nicely to root 11 over two. All right, let's find ourselves a unit vector in the direction of vector v. Well, we know that to find a unit vector in direction of vector v, we need the magnitude. So first we'll find the magnitude. Uh, so the magnitude is similarly, we uh, take the square root of the sum of the components, four squared plus seven squared plus zero is equal to the root 53. And so that goes into our formula as one over root 53 being multiplied by v. And that scales the components down and gives ourselves a vector in the direction of v with unit length. Uh, and that's going to be four over root three in the x direction and seven over root 53 in the j direction. 
and I apologize, it said four over root three in the x direction. I meant four over root 53 in the x direction. And that's it for an introduction of working in space and vectors in three dimensions.